Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human Podcast. I'm Brian Sanders. I'm the creator of the Food Lies six-part series. Check it out at foodlies.org. I've been working on it nonstop. We're doing another filming tour very soon. We're going to get our last interviews. It's so good. This film is going to be so good. I'm telling you, we're finishing it this year. It's a big project. I know everyone's waiting, but it cannot go any faster than it's going now. So support us. Support Food Lies in general. Find me on Instagram at Food Lies, YouTube. Watch the intro. Also, go back and listen to Peak Human from episode one. I talk all about this stuff for years. I've been interviewing all the great experts around the world about these topics. A lot of them will be in the film. Got to go back to episode one, learn all this great stuff. Support us by sharing with friends and family, giving us a review on iTunes or any other podcast app. And also, you can join the newsletter at sapien.org. We send out valuable content only once a week at most. Join the newsletter, sapien.org. And of course, Nose to Tail. This is how it's all possible. Nose to Tail.org. That's where we have our Texas raised meat for sale, grass fed and finished, regeneratively raised. My ranchers are small families. They've been doing this forever. My main beef ranchers have been doing this for 30 years. They took Alan Savory's holistic management class way back in the day. The grandpa took the course before Alan Savory was known at all. We do the best practices. We have the organs ground up in the meat. This is our main product, primal ground beef with organs mixed in, liver, heart, kidney, and spleen. We do a lot too. We put 25% organs in our main one, which is way more than other people do if they do it at all. This is a very exclusive product. Not many people are doing this in the entire world. So you can get that at nosetotail.org. We have our beef tallow skincare. We have deodorant now made from beef tallow, all natural stuff. You don't want weird chemicals or parabens or, or any kind of fragrances. We just use essential oils, beef tallow, and a little bit of olive and coconut oil to get the texture right. So great stuff there. And our biltong. This is if you want to eat on the go, eat meat on the run. And we have the liverboards. That's our main one. It has liver mixed in. 30% liver, great way to get liver in your diet without having to deal with it. Just snack on some sticks, get those nutrients. Also want to talk about Element, LMNT. I've been talking about them recently because I use the product each weekend when I play beach volleyball. I use it if I do a sauna. A lot of times you can sweat out a lot of these electrolytes and you need to replace them. So Element does that for you in an easy package. You can just rip it open, dump it in some water, and you're good to go. It tastes good. I've been friends with this company for a long time. Great people are a part of it, like Rob Wolf. They support me. I support them. You can go to Drink Element, drinklmnt.com slash peakhuman and get a free sample pack if you order. Make sure you use that code peakhuman to get the free sample pack. You get a whole variety of their electrolyte packs for free when you make an order. So support them. Get your electrolytes. I think a lot of people are deficient in potassium, magnesium, and this is a great way to get it. If you have other ways, do that. That's fine. This is just a handy way that I like. So, nosetail.org, once again, to border ranchers. And now, a little bit more about our guest, Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott Scher is an internal medicine MD. He's a co founder of One Base Health and the CEO of Troscriptions and HOME Home. He's a specialist in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and Dr. Scott is interested in all things health, performance, and optimization. He's the man. I love this guy. We've been talking on the phone for a few months now. He's doing some cool things. He's really in line with a lot of the thinking. He's friends with the same people. He runs in the same circles, but he has his own opinion, of course, but I think it is really cool that a lot of this stuff lines up. He gets it. He knows animal-based stuff. He knows ancestral diets. He knows how to go against the big sick care system. And also, I used one of his products while I was doing the show. I had the trochian, these little lozenge-type things with some methylene blue. One of them has a little bit of nicotine in it, which is a great nootropic. And these have been really effective when I'm doing work during the day. It makes my mind feel like it works better. To get into that good work flow state. It gives you a bit of energy. gives you focus. It's kind of like... Adderall, but like way better for you. And instead of harming you, it helps your mitochondria. So he gave us a code for people listening. You can use the promo code SAPIEN. So you go to troscriptions.com and use the code SAPIEN to get a discount 
on these products. It's really cool stuff. I'm telling you, people have been talking about Methylene Blue for a long time. I've heard a lot about it in the biohacking world, and now I've been using it, and I understand it and think it's cool. So try it out if you want, and go to sapien.org, join the newsletter, nosedale.org, get your meat, and please enjoy this one with Dr. Scott. All right, Dr. Scott. Hey, man, how's it going? Brian, it's really great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this must be the fourth time we've talked lately. Uh, so we found out, hey, we know all the same people. We've been running yeah. in these nutrition circles for a while. Definitely. We got teamed up. Great to talk to you. You're an integrative practitioner. Just Let's just start with you. Tell the audience more about yourself real quick. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm an internal medicine physician by training. And, but I practice what I would call an integrative perspective on internal medicine, or really the specialties within that are something called health optimization medicine in practice, home hope for short, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which you alluded to earlier. So my work really started off as the son of a chiropractor growing up in a very alternative environment where there was no box, there was no such thing as conventional medicine. I didn't know there were regular doctors until I was probably going to college, I think. Mm -hmm. And so I saw when he was younger, when I was younger, and he was younger too, of course, in his office, changing people's diet, uh, changing their movement patterns and their allergies, their asthma, their, their medical conditions going away without medical intervention. And so I always knew that the framework that I was going to medical school with, I decided to go to medical school thinking that I had this high-minded idea of I could bring the bridge the chasm between mm -hmm. what is known as conventional medicine, of course, and then what is at that point was just known as alternative medicine, one big bucket. And I call my father and like people like him, like the OG functional medicine provider kinds of do docs, because they weren't just looking at giving you a medicine and sending you out the door. They were like, well, how can I really work on your foundational biology in some way? So I ended up going to medical school. I learned conventional practice. I went to, uh, went to a medical school in Baltimore and had a, had a really nice time. I really learned a lot from a conventional perspective. Uh, I ended up getting an internal medicine residency and then I, that's what I finished and that's why I have a board certification there. And then over the, the decades or more than a decade that's followed, I really have created a practice that's focused on foundational measures, foundational health measures, looking at vitamins, minerals, nutrients, gut health, um, in a framework that's, that I mentioned earlier called health optimization, medicine, and practice founded by a colleague and mentor of mine. His name is Dr. Ted Achacoso. And we have a nonprofit organization that's training doctors and practitioners like me and like you, and it doesn't, you don't have to be a doctor to get mm -hmm. trained in this, to learn how to optimize health rather than treat disease. And then that's the foundation of what I do. And then under that or above that foundation is all the fun, integrative things that you can do to kind of optimize people's health, including hyperbaric oxygen therapy, as you mentioned, but also including what you need to now to feel better as you're look, doing the harder work of actually optimizing. And that's the, the work on Methylene Blue and some of the transcriptions company that we have there too. So that's the short story. I like it. Long I like story. it. Yeah, no, that, that, that was pretty concise. Uh, yeah. We'll dive into each of those. Yeah. I love the, the, the add-on stuff, like the Methylene Blue I've, I've kind of heard about it for years, like a year or two, yeah, but I was yeah. like, what is that? I, I don't know what it is. I just didn't want to look into it. And now I have one in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, one of the transcriptions in my, my mouth that you guys do. And yeah, I yeah. haven't met Dr. Ted yet, but I know he's here in Austin and you know doing some great stuff with you. Yeah, yeah. He's actually based in DC, but we do come to Austin sometimes and, and we do try to travel around and, and do the work and uh, get the, spread the message for sure. Good stuff. Well... You do all the right things. Uh, it's great that you infiltrated the conventional world, you know, got the MD, you know, doing that in, you know, real internal medicine studies and then bringing it to like your, your dad did is, is bridging that gap or going to that side. Um, yeah. Yeah. My father wasn't initially a bridge gapper. He, a gap well, I guess bridger. he was just he was, on he was the just side. Yeah, but, yeah. but now, but, but interestingly, you mentioned it because he was, he's gravitated towards that over time. Right. Mm. And I think that that's the key that. I think is really important is that there's no zero sum game here. You can take from all of these aspects, alternative health, whatever you want to call that conventional medicine, they all have a place and they all have a time and it just depends on where you're engaging in the system. Right? So oftentimes it's for me, it's, do you have an acute issue? That's something that needs to happen right now, or do you have more of a long-term goal or a chronic issue that really requires uh, a focus, not on just conventional measures, but like really looking at that foundation. And that's where diet, lifestyle, nutrition, supplementation, uh, integrative types of practitioners, you know, those, that's where all that kind of stuff plays in before you 
really start doing things conventionally if you can avoid it or if you can at least delay it until you have at least tried some of these other mm -hmm. things before going that route. So that's the that's important for people to realize, I think, too. Oh, I, I appreciate that. And yes, there's always a time and place for those acute interventions. But I mean, I just posted a story today about amazing story of this woman changing her whole life, reversing all these autoimmune conditions, all this stuff just with diet. It's just yep. so amazing. I get, I said, I get 500 stories of the per year sent to me personally, which I do. It could be way more than that. I mean, I, I just don't count. I know it's more than one a day <laughs> Sure. that people just like, Hey, I just started eating animal foods. I started getting whole foods on the side and, and my whole life changed. My body just works better. That's what I was saying. Like, it's amazing that I'm about to turn 40 this summer and mm -hmm. my body just works. And I was in my late twenties and my body didn't work. I had acid reflux. I had allergies. I had joint pain. I had low energy. I had a dad bod forming. <laughs> I had all these things. I'm just like, Oh, my, I'm just going downhill, you know? And then your body, you find just a human diet, right? What we're meant to eat, which is a, a broad array of mm -hmm. sub diets, but your body just works. It's magical. And before we got on the show, like I used to, I, my whole life I had allergies and now 90, 95% result where mm -hmm. I just, I'm fine. And people don't even believe that you can reverse allergies. Right. right. Yeah. It's something that they've had since they were a kid and they feel like it's just lifelong and things like that. But I think, I think you're right. I mean, in the sense that we all, I've seen this as a clinician, you know, time and time again, thousands of times where people just change their diet and see these amazing things happen. What I've realized over the years though, is that it's not easy for people to change their diet right away. Yeah. And it's sometimes nice. And I think really helpful to actually dial it in by understanding not only sort of the macro side of things, but also look, look under the hood. And one of the things we do in, in the, the practice health optimization medicine practice is we look at something called metabolomics. Metabolomics is a big word, but all that really means is that we're looking at real-time cellular processes, looking at your the, the the metabolism itself, looking at vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, looking at signs of how you how well you're you're actually utilizing things like your proteins, your carbohydrates, and your fats, and how well you're mineralizing and how well your you know, your omega three panels and things like that. So it gives you a good sense of where you are. And so like, for example, if you're not eating any meat, oftentimes like vegans or vegetarians even, but especially vegans have a really difficult time maintaining their, their vitamin minerals and, and, and even their gut health and things like that in their transmitter levels, because they're just not getting enough of the, the animal protein, for example. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll work with people and say that are interested, but they're not really interested in changing their diet for whatever reason right away. And then, and this is, uh, it's really, I think effective to look at the data with them and say, this is why it's really important. You're not doing your, your body can't make energy. Your body can't detox effectively, effectively. Your gut is leaky and you have bacterial overgrowth. And there, there's all these other aspects of, of what you can show them like, oh man, I really need, need to take care of this. Well, I can see why I need to take care of it. Right. So, and like, so it's a data driven way of supplementing and data way of a data driven way of changing your diet. And then I feel like that can be helpful for people too. Um, but it's usually, but as you said, it's usually very simple. Like they took out dairy for two weeks and all of a sudden they're like, they don't have a runny nose all day and they're not coughing all the time or something. Right. Or they start eating meat and all of a sudden like their brain feels like they, it actually works at all times in the day, instead mm -hmm. of like being ups and downs all day and just having the trials and tribulations of, of, of that. Absolutely. I guess data, if, if someone works with you or doctors like you, it's so much easier for them to change their diet and lifestyle and especially using data because no, I, I, I think half the battle is getting people to change, right? I, I always wrestle with this because I think that people have the wrong information about what to do, but even if they have the right information, how do you get them to change? So I guess to ask you, I mean, part of it is using actual data and using- yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think using data is, is really important for, I think, helping people motivate and then watching that data over time, how it changes, especially if you've been compliant with the things that you're looking to do, dietary changes, supplementation, exercise, things like that. And so you can see these changes over time. And, and you know, honestly, for some people, it can be subtle. It, can, it may not be something that you see immediately change when you start changing your diet, start changing your lifestyle. A lot of people it will be, but some people it won't. And then understanding that what you're doing when you're looking at the data and working with it over time is that you're creating a sustainable health 
program for them, a sustainable health model that will work with them over the long term. And that's really the key, I think, for people is that getting out of this short term game and getting more into the long term game. Um, but not to say that people don't have things that they're suffering from right now that need to get addressed. And that's where something like methylene blue is very interesting because methylene blue specifically something that helps with energy production and it helps with detoxification with resilience at the same time and so the for-profit company the transcriptions company the company that makes uh, what's in your mouth over there and the they're, they're called buckle trochies these, these are like dissolvable lozenges that go in your mouth that dissolve up here um, they dissolve over about 15 to 30 minutes and the reason why they're in the mouth is because it dissolves much faster into the brain circulation and also bypasses digestion. And so if you have digestive issues um, and even a lot of the supplements, most supplements people take, the bioavailability, the amount that actually gets into the body is extremely low compared to what you swallowed. Common example here, something like N-acetylcysteine or NAC for short is about 10% bioavailable. So you take a, a 600 milligram pill, you're only gonna get about 60 milligrams of that that actually gets into the body kind of thing. So we, des we designed the trochies to be buckle, which means it dissolves in the mucosa up here so that it bypasses the, the challenges of bioavailability and also that it directly goes into circulation into the brain and into the, into the circulation of the brain right there in the vascular system too. But the key really, I think for work, when I work with clinic, work with clients is the first thing, as I mentioned is, is this an acute issue or is this a chronic issue? Like this or a long-term issue? Like if it's acute, then we just kind of throw the, like the proverbial educationally shit at the wall kind of thing, right? You know, they might need conventional things. They might need alternative things. You just do it all at the same time. And then, but if it's a, if it's a long-term issue or chronic issue, uh, brain fog, fatigue, uh, you know, chronic medical issue, et cetera, um, bloating and you know, whatever it might be like, then that's when you really want to do the work of of really kind of dialing their dialing in their their um, what's under the hood the metabolomic panel as I was mentioning looking at vitamins minerals and nutrients and then on top of that you start looking at what you could do now to help help them feel better and that could be something like a transcriptions product like like our methylene blue product for example to help su support the system as they're doing it and then of course then you can add other types of practices technologies you know the hyperbaric chamber for example other things depending on what they need but in essence. My work is really like a, a smoke screen for trying to optimize people's health, no matter what they come and see me. Like they can say, Hey, Dr. Scott, I have a migraine. I'm like, okay, well, they might ask me like, let's get it. Can I get into a hyperbaric chamber? I'm like, well, you could, but you should do let's, let's consider all these things first before you even think about going in to see if you can have mm -hmm. a sustainable benefit from going into a hyperbaric chamber. The same thing might be for, uh, for, you know, taking like taking a supplement, for example, like, you know, Dr. Scott, should I take this supplement for my my migraines again. Well, well, let's measure what you need and let's see what you have under the hood again, and then take a look at the holistic perspective. Like, what are your vitamins, minerals, and nutrients? What are your hormones doing? You know, what's your gut health looking like? So, it's uh, it's harder for people, right? Because they have to do more, but it's more sustainable when you can get them there. So, mm. but then you want to make them feel better as fast as you can. So, something like methylene mm. blue is really good because it helps you feel a little bit better, gives you a little bit of support as you're doing all this other more sustainable work and really trying to comprehensively help somebody rather than just, you know, take a pill and call me in the morning kind of thing. I like your sneaky approach where, yeah, <laughs> someone could come in for migraines and then yeah. three years later, they're like a new person and they <laughs> solve like five other issues. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't take that long, but, but yeah, oh, you're yeah, right. Well, yeah. 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 But I um, but like even three or six months later, like they're seeing a, a fantastic benefit most of the time, but it, like, that, that's my, it's my smoke screen. I like to call it right. Because people know me a lot, a lot of, a lot of the, the media that I've done over the last several years is in the hyperbaric space, but often I'll say that 80% of the, my conversation with anybody is about all the other things first, before you even consider getting into a chamber, unless it's an acute issue. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the short-term thing too. And I think the, the feedback loop is something I'm interested in, is short-term thinking and then feedback loops because it's hard for people to make change without the feedback loop. Right. And with nutrition, it is sort of this long feedback loop that you, it's really hard to even get the feedback. People don't think about, oh, what I ate for the past like month or even three days ago really affects me and how I feel, right? They don't get that. And nutrition, even in general, is such a long-term game. It's like you could be vegan for two years and then yep. all the problems finally catch up to you. And that's the hardest part about the nutrition stuff is the long feedback loop and there's just people don't even know. 
It's really difficult. Yeah. I mean, you make a good point about certain things like food sensitivities that may pop up three days after you've eaten something, you don't realize that that's what you've done. And so you can, you can actually get some laboratory testing now and see like what foods you're sensitive, sensitive to, not only from like a, an immediate sensitivity, but also something like IgG4, which is a, uh, something that we use in, in the work that we do in, in the health optimization medicine and practice, but it's just a marker like anything else, right? It's not something like that you need to take. It's not gospel per se, but it's just another data point in a network of data points where we're looking to really see how you're doing cellularly. And and the key also, I think, and this is something that gets lost a lot in, in this work and because there's a lot of functional medicine providers, a lot of integrative providers, but the key, I think the difference between what we do and what a lot of other people are doing is that we're looking at optimal levels of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, gut health, neurotransmitters, et cetera. We're not looking at normal levels. So there's a difference, right? Mm. So if you go to most labs and get your laboratory testing done, they're going to give you a normal level. Okay. That le level is usually in adults greater than 18 years old, and then less than maybe 75, 65, 90, depending on the lab. So like if you get your thyroid checked, your TSH, you're going to get a TSH level of somebody between 18 and 75 years old. And then they, they, they average all that out. And then whatever you have is your normal inside that, right? However, what is optimal for somebody 21 to 30 years of age? Because that's really the ages Although I guess things are different for you now, Brian, than they were when you were in that time frame. Mm -hmm. But for most people, we're the most resilient. We have the most energy. We have the most performance capacity, and we all know this from athletics and everything else. Um, in that twenty-one to thirty years of age, um, the problem, as as you know from your work, is that this is changing, and that this this range is getting smaller because people are getting sicker earlier. But in general, what we do with the work in, in our practice, in my practice, is we look at shifting those levels of, of all those data points that I just mentioned to when you were 21 and 30 years of age. So your normal becomes not just normal, it becomes optimal. Mm. And this includes looking at hormone optimization too. I mean, obviously women have menopause when they you know get in their late 40s and 50s, but, but men also have andropause as well. They also start their testosterone start to, starts declining, their growth hormone starts declining. And there's ways to reverse these things with certain types of exercise and food and things like that. But sometimes hormone optimization for men is really important too. Um, if it's done in a, in a network wide range perspective, meaning that you're not just looking at testosterone, you're looking at all of the, the, the problem I think a lot out there is that you're just getting like TRT, for example. I think that that's probably misguided for most people because you forget about all the other hormones and all the other re, um, feedback loops uh, you were talking about for food. But there's also mm -hmm. these other, all, also our hormone feedback loops that we have as well that are super important to, to keep in mind when you're looking at all this. But um, but yes, sh long story short, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, well, no, let's dive into the... the yeah. That no, this is good. The hormone yeah. optimization is great. People are probably like, oh, I, I want to know about the testosterone. Okay. Or like, I'm a man. I don't want to, you know, have low T. There's huge statistics right now about how it's declining as a population. Yep. And I, I, we know why, right? Well, yeah. I mean, everything around us, our diet, our lifestyle. There's like plastics. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. What 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 is your take on? Why? I mean, exactly like you said, it's it's an environmental exposure, right? For the most part, and when they've done all these sort of I, there's controversy around this as far as like the last human that's going to be born naturally because of testosterone mm -hmm. levels, right? Mm -hmm. But there'll probably be these enclaves in like Austin, Texas, where all the all the women have to come to get pregnant or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we got women in our crew too. No, there's a there's a men and women in here that we're no, we're creating a superhuman race over here. I, know, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I mean there are these pockets around the world that are like that, right? And mm -hmm. and certainly we know that so one of the the pillars of health optimization medicine is something called exposomics, which is just a word of the study of toxins in our environment and the toxins in, of the environment that sort of become in, in, in part of us, right? They become, they get inside of us, they, they create their own metabolites, they create their own uh, things that you can measure basically, like gly glyphosate is a very common one, right? So mm -hmm. you can measure glyphosate in your urine, you can measure glyphosate in your blood, um, et cetera. So you can measure all these kinds of things. And so we know that naturally, even in a non-toxic environment, our human hormone levels are going to decline over time. It's just, it's the nature of the human system, right? The, the aging system as it goes, um, you'll have hormones decline, but these are being accelerated because of the toxic, toxic environment that we're all in these days. And so yes, testosterone levels have dropped dramatically and that's a big deal. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that on the exposomic side. 
you were talking about some of the the plastics and some of the the estrogen type of mm -hmm. uh, of material of uh, of chemicals that are being I forget the name of them, but you know what I'm talking about the well, like all the estrogen like phthalates yeah. or I mean yeah. if you're talking about specific ones, yeah, I mean the Dr. Anthony J wrote a whole book about it called Estrogeneration. So. Yes, I've heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that we're, for that reason and many others, but what it comes down to when you're looking at hormone optimization, and this is kind of a it's a kind of advanced topic to be honest. But like the the short story of it, as I was describing before, is that you have a decline in these hormones, and these hormones are protective. You know, testosterone is protective, growth hormone is protective, estrogen is protective, progesterone is protective. Right? We know there was just a study that was just recently published that um, estrogen bioidentical HRT in women prevents dementia or can decrease your risk mm -hmm. of getting dementia as a female. And so there was a lot of bad things that came out. I think it was back in like the late '90s, early 2000s of of HRT causing uh, increased risk of things like uh, DVTs or D, a D vein uh, D vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or clots in your in your lungs or your or your legs. And there is a risk for that, but the challenge is that they weren't were, those things were always using synthetic types of hormones and not using bioidentical types mm -hmm. of hormones. And they weren't weren't looking whether you're looking at males or females, but at this point they were looking at females. They weren't looking at the whole gamut of hormones. They were just looking at estrogen and progesterone. You have to remember that all these hormones, they work together in feedback loops from the pituitary gland and you have your thyroid, you have your adrenal glands, you have your, you have your, your gonads, you have your, your ovaries, you have your testicles that are making hormones and they're all feedback looping on each other. Um, up and up and up and up and, and down and down. And, and they're all looking to see how much you have and how much you don't have. So the key really is to, when you're looking at hormone optimization, you really do have to look at it from an entirety perspective and not just looking at like you have low T, right? So we have low T, you have low testosterone, but what, how are your adrenal hormones looking? How's your cortisol? Are you making enough steroid hormone to, uh, to make enough, uh, stress hormones in your body? Or have you depleted that so much because you're always in sympathetic mode? You're always in stress, stress, stress. You don't have any time to rest and things like that. So if you just, if you just work on your testosterone, but you don't work on your cortisol level, if you have your growth hormone, that's also uh, that's also being secreted by your pituitary gland. Like if that's also low, that that's also going to be a problem. You're not going to be able to sleep well. You're not going to be able to make muscle well. You're not going to, um, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to really feel like you're digesting well either, because you know, when your G when your growth hormone levels go down, it also affects digestion. So like, anyway, the, mm -hmm. the, the long story short of it is that these hormones really need to be looked at in a network. Um, and that all of us really after the age of like 40 or so should be really considering looking at these and getting them tested to see where you are and making sure that things don't, you know, things aren't out of whack at that point. So, yeah. So people just going in to get TRT, it's kind of like really myopic, right? They're just going after one little thing and they're just trying to solve it. And could that have negative effects too? I mean, if you're just yeah. really just trying to jack up your <laughs> testosterone without addressing the constellation of things. Yes, absolutely. Because you know, if you're just looking at testosterone and you're just repleting that, first of all, if you go too high, it's also going to decrease your your endogenous, your internal production, and that that's what happens in people's testicles get very small, right? You don't. That's like that happens with steroids too, as as people know. The other thing that can happen is that. Um, you also can shut down your adrenal glands as well, because your adrenal glands um, that, are, that are on top of your kidneys, <clears throat> excuse me, they make testosterone too. Um, and they also, and this is really important for women, but also important for men, but they don't only just make testosterone. They make other hormones as well that are extremely important for the body, like DHEA, for example, and pregnenolone. And these are down-regulated. These go down in production if there's a lot of testosterone around because the adrenal glands start making less of the testosterone. So you it's really important. And I've seen this time and time again, um, you really have to be looking at the entire axes, all the axes of hormones when you're looking at just, if you're looking at testosterone, because if you do, if you just look at it in a myopic way, you're going to start seeing deficiencies in other aspects of your hormonal axes. Mm -hmm. Super important. How do you, what are some of these interventions that you do? I mean, you, there, there's so many, it's hard to speak broadly on this because sure. it's per the individual, but yeah, what are t some types of diet, lifestyle, and or you know specific, I don't know, supplements just before sure. you get to like the the TRT the hormones. thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, you don't want to. I, mean, I just talked to somebody, a client of mine, maybe a couple weeks ago about this exactly, and he was eating very, very little protein, you know, very little animal protein. He wasn't working out. Um, he wasn't doing any heavy lifting, and we know that. Um, 
you know, high intensity interval training, strength training. We know that diets that are higher in animal foods tend to raise things like your testosterone and your growth hormone levels. And so there's some good data on that too. So it's not, you know, I'm not just saying these kinds of things. So like when you, when you when we look at somebody that comes in, that's not having a lot of meat, they're not having a lot of exercise, um, or they're running too much, or they're just having too much cardiac exercise and not getting enough strength training. You know, muscle is probably the, yeah. the most important thing for both of these anabolic hormones, especially your testosterone level and your growth hormone level. We know that muscle mass is probably the most important there. It doesn't mean they have to have like jacked huge, but you have, but like but having good amount of lean body mass is really important. That's where I would typically start. And then from a supplementation perspective, it really depends on what's going on. There's, there's a very specific type of protein called, um, SHBG. It's, um, it's a, it's a protein that binds testosterone in the body. And if people have more inflammation, if they don't eat a lot of meat actually too, um, or if, um, if they have any, some medical conditions can do this as well, that you have a lot of bound testosterone, like it's not being released. You can take something like stinging nettle root, for example, which is a pretty common supplement that you can get over the counter that helps unbind the testosterone mm. from this particular protein. So the problem with a lot of TRT is that like, they're just going to like smash you with more testosterone and just try to overcome the amount that's being bound by just giving you more, but that's not really the answer per se. Mm. Is the there... answer per se is to understand like why is that why is that H SHBG elevated and trying to work on decreasing that and that's typically an inflammatory it's almost like an inflammatory marker I would say so in your experience can you address most people just with the other diet lifestyle supplementation or, or is there like a time and place for some correct dosage of the TRT no I think there is definitely a time and place for the correct dosage of testosterone replacement growth hormone replacement uh, even thyroid replacement uh, cortisol sometimes that those are necessary as we get older uh, the, there's a higher chance of these things uh, depending on just kind of some a lot of this is genetics to be honest it's some like how much you're going to be get, getting secreted as you get older and of course also your diet your lifestyle and things like that so but I think you know the majority of people can do a significant amount without actually taking hormones without bioidenticals and things like that until they get to be around 50 or 60 years of age. And then at that point, typically some replacement uh, with bioidenticals is likely going to be, I wouldn't say necessary, but certainly helpful from a, from a, not from a, a longevity, like the, it's always the question. I'm sure you get this too, Brian. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like long, do you want to live a long time? Um, Dr. Dr. Ted, one of my colleagues like to say, like, if, if you ask for longevity, also ask for eternal youth, right? So if you want to live forever, you better also ask in the same breath to, to be young at the same time. Otherwise, you know, old and decrepit and live the last 30 years of your life, not very happy. Right. So, um, I think, I think the key is if, if you're looking to optimize your health, and your longevity, but especially your health span. Like then I think hormones do come into play sometime in your fifties, maybe even younger, sometimes in your forties mm. as well, but getting tested with, you know, getting a laboratory evaluation, seeing where things are, and then optimizing diet, lifestyle, supplementation is primary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, if you continue to need a little bit of support, then, then you get the support and you can do that. And, and I think in a very intentional way in a very holistic way and not just thinking about just one hormone at a time. That's when people can get in trouble usually. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious about this. I'm nowhere near ready for this. I'm going to do it all natural. I, I I'm still all natural. I don't do anything. That's, uh, that's all good. Yeah. yeah. I just, but I know, but it is, I, I say that you, you don't, you can't cheat nature. Right. And right. that, you can't like, I don't like this stuff, but maybe there is some to be optimal. You're talking about health optimization. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And we do exactly. may have some new technologies that can give you an edge. So I'm not saying throw out everything. It's like, if there right. are things that give you an edge when you're 50, 60, that we didn't have for all of history, I'm open to that. And I think, look, the data doesn't lie. Right. So like you can see somebody's testosterone in the tank. It's like, that's what it says. Like you've done everything. Like you've done, you're doing your, you're doing your, your high intensity of interval training, you've, you've changed your diet, right? You're, you're, you've changed all the, your environment, your lifestyle, your supplements, and you still have low testosterone. Do you take something then? Or do you not? You know, it's, it's really up, it's up to you as a, as a, as a person, right? Do, mm -hmm. do you want to do that? You want to see how you feel you, I mean, and I'm completely on board, but again, and I, I'm really specific about this. It's not the first option for most people. The first option is, look, you have low testosterone, you have low growth hormone levels. These are the ways that we can optimize it. Sometimes we use 
not the direct hormones themselves, but things that help those hormones work better, like peptides, for example. And I'm sure you know peptides, but there's mm-hmm. like there's growth hormone analogs, for example, that are used pretty commonly in the bodybuilding world, but also in the health optimization world because they can help help you secrete more growth hormone, for example, if yours is lacking, for example. So, but again, it's always in the context of doing the work if people are ready to do it. Yeah, and that's that's always another question, right? As far as are people ready to like really start putting in the work and trying to reverse these things naturally with diet, lifestyle, exercise, supplementation. So it's a, it's a conversation, but I, I certainly start there with most people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can we go back to the chronic cardio real quick? Cause I, I always hate on the chronic cardio people and hopefully they don't okay. dislike me and stop listening, but I'm into strength training and sprinting and, you know, walking. I'm not into this chronic cardio. I think I've seen it just fail too many times people I know myself mm. just it, it's like this chronic cardio it's almost doing the opposite of what you want it's it's kind of telling your body to not get stronger and to kind of hold on to fat and it's just this chronic inflammation just chronic everything it, it, in a bad way what do you what do you think I mean look there's it's a drug for people um, when it comes down to it. <clears throat> and it's a drug because you get endorphins, you get natural, the endocannabinoid system, the system that we've named after the cannabis plant, but we have in our body that gives us this feeling of bliss. There's a particular neurotransmitter called anandamide uh, that is actually increased by something that, like taking CBD increases this as well. But we know that exercise, we used to think of it as just as an endorphin hit, but really is a lot of endocannabinoids floating around, including especially an and- anandamide is the one that people mm. will be interested in learning more about. Ananda means a bliss in Sanskrit for those who like Sanskrit. I don't know. They say runner's high, the runner's the, high. The runner's high is, is, yeah. is a combination of, of, cannab- of endocannabinoids and, and the endorphins as well. And so, I mean, there's all this work that's been done recently. I'm sure, you know, on phase two training, the idea that you're training at like lower, a lower heart rate mm-hmm. for a longer period of time. This is sort of like a brisk walk, as you were saying, or maybe like a, like a, a slow run, for mm-hmm. example. And I think there is a lot of benefit to that, but certainly even phase two cardio or zone two, excuse me, zone two cardio is probably something you shouldn't be doing every day. It's something that should be done periodically, maybe a couple times a week. But you know, the way our ancestors would have done this, they wouldn't have ran like, you know, as just constantly for one, at one speed for hours upon yeah. hours. And, you know, honestly, Brian, I see this in laboratory data. Like I was talking to a client just a couple of days ago who runs, he runs 50 kilometers a week. And I can see it in his laboratory data. His oxidative stress levels are in, through the roof. He has, um, he's not making energy effectively. His vitamin mineral levels are low. He's, his diet's great, actually. He's, uh, he's, he's got a really good diet. He's really clean. Um, you know, he, he checks his sleep. He does everything else, but he loves to run. And, mm-hmm. and, and so I'm like, look, man, we have to find other ways for you to find wow, yeah. that, that same way of feeling because this exercise is, going, is causing inflammation in your system. And it's causing rusting of the whole process, right? So what happens when you're, when you're seeing rust in the system is that you're seeing what's called oxidative stress build up. You're seeing the products of energy metabolism and of the waste products of, 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 of ATP uh, production. You're seeing those build up in the system. And then you have antioxidants in the body, like your vitamin C, your glutathione, methylene blue actually works like this too. It helps build up and protect you from all those reactive oxygen species. But the problem is that if you're doing so much running all the time or you're, or you're, or you're sympathetic all the time, or you're like in a high energy state all the time, or even drinking tons of caffeine or whatever it might be, like you're going to burn through your antioxidant stores. And then you're going to have all this oxidation that's on in the system that can't be reversed. It can't be reduced. It's, or it can't be neutralized is the best word to say it. So as a result of that, like I had this frank conversation with him. I'm like, look, man, there's only so much I can do with your labs. I can't do anything else unless you're going to start changing what you're doing from a physical perspective. Mm. Like we're talking, and we talked about strength training. We talked about high intensity interval training. You know, we talked about, um, we talked about high heat saunas and we talked about other kinds of things that can be really great, but they don't stress the system in the same way Mm -hmm. as pounding on the pavement for 50 kilometers a week kind of thing. Did he have high CRP? He did. Yeah. 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 Uh, high elevated CRP, um, high SHBG as well, which is this, the binding protein that binds testosterone. And these are common. Like, and, and these are things that I, I see with a lot of the athletes that I've worked with over time. Um, most athletes are overtraining in general. So they're training too much and not recovering. And you can see that in your laboratory data. Like I can see that. And mm-hmm. I'm like, dude, you haven't been recovering. Like, and so 
if they don't have a cho- don't have a choice, then there's certain certain things that we can do. I have a one athlete that I work with. He's an older athlete. He's 60 years old, and like we have to do we have to go through like the ends of the earth to try to optimize this guy because he's a triathlete and the kinds of uh, the kinds of work he's doing on a daily basis. Like it's, it's almost impossible. Like, but I try <laughs> so because yeah. like, he's like, well, I'm going to do a marathon swim tomorrow. I'm like another one. <laughs> so, uh-huh. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because people, you have to meet people where they are, but you want to try to bring them on a journey. Right. So I try to give them things that they can use now, like methylene blue, like I talked about great for energy production, great for antioxidant reserve at the same time. So that at least that they're feeling better, I'm giving them more support while I'm trying to get them to do the harder work of really optimizing on, on a foundational level. Mm. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know, we should go back to female side because we kind of dwelled on the, the male side and, you know, sure. females need testosterone too, but yes. maybe you could just talk more about the, the female side to the hormone story. Yeah. I mean, so I, you, that's a really good point. I have a, a, a number of my colleagues that work specifically in, in, with, with females and doing hormone and bioidentical optimization. And I mentioned earlier uh, about the, the recent study on estrogen and dementia. So we know that if you're, if you're on HRT, if you're in menopause, you have a lower risk of getting dementia than if you're not on HRT, for example. Um, high, this is hormone replacement therapy, right? And this is, again, with bioidentical th- hormones is most likely the best. These are the hormones that the body has seen for millions of years um, as our evolution has, has progressed instead of synthetic ingredients or synthetic chemicals or, or the uh, synthetic uh, equivalents of what, the, what you'd get in the body. And that's, I think, where a lot of the trouble was back in the late 90s and 2000s. But yeah, women, so, I mean, women have their hormone decline that's much more profound and much more uh, challenging than men overall because it's it's well known it's it's obviously something that's much more sort of known and and seen um, and so when those hormones start dropping and they become sort of more perimenopausal there's a lot of ups and downs but the, the good thing is that you know I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of uh, practitioners that I work with that can do a lot of great work with women to really make that a much easier transition um, you know diet lifestyle sugar for example is a big one for for women going through perimenopausal state as well and and trying to regulate their hormones as best they can. Um, but I oftentimes, I, I work with mostly men, I would say. Um, I, my practice, I, I tend to work with a lot of amazing women practitioners and that work specifically with women on hormone and hormone cycles and hormone optimization um, because I really I really feel like that's a really specialized world. I work with 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 per, with postmenopausal women, but especially women that are that are sort of perimenopausal and still menstruating, I, I tend to I tend to refer to a lot of my clients that are doing work specifically in that population. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So before we move to methylene blue, cause we've mentioned it four times already. Um, yeah, yeah. I want to just like kind of recap just the, the diet side, because, you know, you talked about the importance of animal foods, but do you have sort of a general framework of how yeah. people should eat? You think? Yeah. I mean, it's changed over the years. I mean, I think that like everything else, this is an evolving science as we see things, but in general, I tend to be more on a moderate protein, moderate fat and a low carbohydrate program from most people. And I think that if you're a, a, a very, uh, if you're an athlete, if you're doing a lot of exercise every day, I think your, your carbohydrate levels can go up, of course, because you're burning through those. Um, and, but I think protein is a, a very vastly underutilized, uh, macronutrient. And I think that most people aren't getting enough of it, especially as they get getting older. And, and we worry about something called sarcopenia, which is like the loss of muscle mass as we get above about 40 or 50 years of age, it starts happening younger, actually even earlier than that. But certainly after the age of 40 or so uh, for men and for females, a little bit older than that, potentially. So, um, you know, for me, it's that's usually where I start with people is I start with, uh, you know, obviously the fats are not coming from your McDonald's, your French fries, your, you know, and that's the hard thing with with nutrition studies, as we all know, it's like they're they're equating like. Uh, a burger from McDonald's to a steak in their studies because you ate meat, right? But that's Mm -hmm. not the same thing at all as, you know, most of us can really understand, even people that are not smart. No, that's Mm -hmm, not the same mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I saw you posted recently about the lucky charm steak debate, right? And I, and it's, it's all the ridiculous things out there by just like looking at the component macronutrients that they think are healthy, as opposed to looking at the actual food itself and what's been around a million or plus years and what we've been eating. Right. So, um, in general, I'm, I'm more in like, let's call it on the ancestral side. Like Mm -hmm. if, if somebody says to me, like, what are the things that I can do that to help with my health now? Like I usually say, 
Stop the processed foods, stop the added sugar. If you can go gluten and dairy free for three months to see how you feel and, and try to get more protein if you, and like, and more animal protein, like that would be like the five things that I, mm -hmm. I ask people to do because like, that's a lot. Right. But uh -huh. even if, if I had to take out, even I would even take out like the, 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 I'm, I'm a big fan of people going dairy free for three months to see how they feel, because I really do feel like that's a big one for a lot of people, especially you know, like the, the, the pasteurized dairy products. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's non-pasteurized, if you have that option and, and it's safe for you, that's probably a different story. Um, although I'm not entirely sure, but I think so. Um, but that's what I would say for most people is as I usually start off there, but then I, then I dial in their macros depending on what their goals are, mm -hmm. uh, what their, and, and what their data looks like, what they're, what they're looking like from a cellular perspective and kind of going from mm -hmm. there. You nailed it. You nailed it. Ancestral approach. It's so simple. Yeah. What did we have back then? And the only thing you didn't cover is just, yeah, the type of fats you kind of covered it. It's like, yeah, we're not talking about processed oils. We're talking about eating natural fat uh, that yeah. we've always eaten. And the dairy yeah. things is a good story too, because I'm glad you mentioned it. not some people can do great with the raw dairy yeah. and you have to try it, but maybe even people should try no dairy just to see how they feel. Then add back in the raw dairy. Yeah, that's what I would typically say. I mean, for my the people that I work with, it's like it's really common to think that you don't have a problem with something, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, oh, I, I do, I, I eat dairy all the time, I'm fine, you know, or I eat gluten all the time, I'm fine. But the problem is that, especially if you're a guy, we don't we don't tend to be as in tune with how we feel. Women tend to be mm -hmm. better at understanding these kinds of things. And I would be an example of this. I mean, when I went off dairy, went off, I, I did a gluten free thing, maybe you know, nine or ten years ago. Now, I'm like, I'm fine with gluten. I was eating it all the time. I had no, you know, this is, I was, you know, ten years younger. It wasn't an issue. I didn't think. And then I stopped it for three months. And then I restarted it and I started cl clearing my throat all the time again. I didn't know I had stopped mm. doing it. I forgot that I did it all the time. Mm -hmm. And then when I st started going back on gluten, I was starting to clear my throat all the time. So it could be mild like that, but that's usually like a harbinger of something more significant, right? If it's like, if you have like a little bit of constipation, a little bit of diarrhea, like a little bit of clearing your throat when you go onto these things, like that's more significant than you can realize because that's something that can build up or cause an issue over time. And so that's what I think we don't, I mean, we kind of write these things off when you're younger, right? But as we get older, like, well, maybe, maybe there's something going on here, right? So like, at least it, because now I don't feel as well all the time. Like now I have more mood swings. Now I have more energy swings. I used to be, I used to have all this energy all the time and now I don't, right? So, um, but yeah, you mentioned, uh, just to mention on the fat mm -hmm. briefly, um, I, for a little while, I thought everybody should go keto like everybody else did back mm -hmm. like 10 years ago or not even like maybe five years ago. But I certainly, I, there's certainly a, a population of people that I think do very well on a high fat, you know, low, like moderate protein and low carbohydrate diet. But I think overall, um, it's something you have to be careful of. Um, and, and not everybody's going to do well on that diet over the long term. Um, but I think there's like medical reasons to go on a ketogenic diet. And I work with patients that are on them all the time. And I think there might be good, a good thing to kind of cycle in and out of, you know, not fasting and having sort of natural fat burning going on as well. But I don't necessarily think that, you know, being high fat all the time is probably good for most people these days. They're all tools. Right. Yes. Yeah. There's carnivore too. It's like, yeah, man, if you have like IBS or you have Crohn's disease and you have all these things going on, let's do it. Fine. But it's just, these are all tools. Keto, great tool. Great tool. All Agreed. kinds of things are great tools, but um, people yeah. get obsessed right. with them because they find good results and then they think that that's the only way to do it. Yep. Yeah, we all get, and then you start getting your keto ice cream and your keto cookies and <laughs> your keto pizza and, you know, yeah. there you go. And then yeah. what are you eating? Exactly. Yeah, no. That's, yeah. oh man, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to get people, steer them to the whole foods and then yeah. play with different things and then see how you're optimal. And it, it's, yeah, it's usually a foundation of, of animal foods with, by calories, you know, with the protein right. and the fats and then fill it in with how you feel, right? Like some people can go more fat. Some people can go more fruit and natural sources of carbs. Mm -hmm. You just dial it in, right? You can go different directions. If you're mm -hmm. an athlete, you do one thing. If you, you know, like whatever, whatever works. That's why yeah. it's like people say, oh, there's no one size fits all diet. I'm like, well, kind of, there's a one size fits all framework, which all humans should be in. And then within that very specific sort of framework, uh, we can dial it in completely differently, kind of. Yeah, I actually agree with that overall. I mean, and I dial it in, like you said, with the goals in mind and also with their metrics in mind, you can watch their 
can get them on a CGM and see what happens when they use certain types of food and when they use certain types of food, a continuous glucose monitor. Mm -hmm. So you can see what their, what their glucose are, levels are when they have certain foods after exercise, after without exercise or, or on their own or with combinations of other foods together in certain orders. And like, you can get really into the weeds of these kinds of things, which is interesting and, but not absolutely necessary for most people. I think that getting started with a framework and then working your way in that using data, like using your cellular data, as I was mm -hmm. discussing before. And then, but also like you're looking at some of these other types of data metrics, like, like your glucose levels over time is, is pretty interesting as well. I love all that stuff. There's the C, the CGM stuff and you mentioned them all really quickly. Yes. You can do exercise before, after eating carbs and you take a walk after and it'll lower yep. the blood sugar response. You can eat different, uh, you can eat apple cider vinegar or, you know, certain like vegetable matter right. before you eat the carbs, you can eat the carbs last. You can do eat the whole food carbs instead of the processed carbs. There's so many different, variations. so many different ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the key also just to kind of put a one little nuance on the continuous glucose monitor debate is that the question is, should you have insulin spikes or not? And the answer is that, you know, we don't think it's great to have them all the time, right? In the sense that we don't think it's great for your, your blood sugar to go super high, then, you know, then come on down and that can cause, you know, hunger pangs that can cause energy challenges and things, but there's probably some need for some, for your body's own hormetic understanding of having these spikes is also important, right? So um, I think we get a little bit in the CGM world, they're getting a little bit um, militant about staying within a certain range all the time. I think it's probably not good for that as well. I think it's also okay to have occasional spikes mm -hmm. to go up and down so that you have your body having to be able to react to these kinds of things. And I mean, naturally, when you work out, if you exercise, your blood sugar is going to go up and that's natural, right? Because that's mm -hmm. the body's response. It's called your cortisol response. It's your, your, your steroid, your stress response. That's going to increase your blood sugar. And that's a good thing. You actually, your, your cortisol goes up when you have, when you're, when you're fighting an infection as well. So you want your cortisol response to be able to work. So that's like, that's why I want to kind of just emphasize that sometimes people get a little stuck in that data, but I think it's important to know that having some spikes is okay. As long as your blood sugar comes down you know, quickly after it does go up as well. I think that's a big topic. Maybe we can spend a few more minutes on that because yeah. like once you get into the keto world or the CGM world, do you think everything's about blood sugar, but then yeah. there's a whole nother way of thinking of like, maybe it's not, it, it's not the blood sugar that your body can handle some of these spikes. I mean, you don't want it to be, you know, five times a day being on this roller coaster and right. that can't be good. Or, you know, eating like highly refined foods. Well, and it's going to the moon, but if you're just eating natural foods and there is some sort of spikes, like it doesn't seem like that's getting people sick. That's not how type two diabetes starts. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, like you said, I think a lot of it's in the nuance here. So it's a little bit of harder, harder conversation to have, but I, I think that the, the main overall message I want to kind of give people is that if you're taking, if you're on a CGM and you're outside of the range, some of the time it's okay, right? The idea really is that as long as your blood sugar is coming down quickly after it comes up, that's really what you want to see. You just don't want your blood sugar to be sustaining at a high level mm -hmm. because that's not good. I mean, certainly spikes all the time are, are not awesome either, but just knowing that like it's a bit of a stress on your body and that's an okay thing, right? It's just like because your cortisol has to, has to learn and your insulin has to learn how to do these kinds of things. It's like, if you don't need any carbs ever and you have carbs, like your body's going to be like, oh shit, I have carbs. They're going to like, you know, you're going to spike everything, right? Yeah. Exactly. So like, like you don't want to like, that's why it's really important to kind of find that sort of balance in there too. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to drive at, but this is, this is really like kind of more of a nuanced conversation. I think with a practitioner that kind of has a, has a better understanding, uh, and looking at your markers, looking at your, like you talked about earlier, your CRP levels, looking at like some of your inflammatory markers, so you can see not only your, um, your, your blood glucose level that's, but also what's your oral glucose tolerance test look like. So you can actually take a bolus or take like, like a, like a significant amount of glucose and see what your blood sugar does over several, several hours afterwards. And also your insulin response as well. And that's a better measure of understanding really your, your insulin response than even looking at your CGM is most likely. So it's, you know, there's other kinds of nuances in here that are, mm -hmm. that are interesting just for people to know it. I think you're already on this, Brian. It's like, you don't want to, it's not, there's no gospel here. This is just like, there's mm -hmm. frameworks that you try to work with. And then you figure out your way inside those frameworks that works best for you looking at subjective and objective data as much as you can mm -hmm. together um, so that you can make educated understandings of what you want to do and how you want to change over time. And, and like that, and that really comes down to like the work that we do in health optimization medicine. It's like, you're doing these things over time. You're working at that foundation and then you're 
you're tweaking it as you go. And then you're also using things like methylene blue or even other products that we have to like to work on the system as you're doing the harder work uh, or the more sustainable work of really optimizing your health. It's good. It's good. I'm curious, what's your current understanding or current thesis theory of why people develop type two diabetes? I have no idea what you think. I have I didn't prepare you for this at all. I don't know if you talk about it, but it's just so interesting to me of like, why does this happen? Right? It's like some people it's like, it's just carbs. And some people are saying it's just the seed oils. Maybe it's causing metabolic dysfunction. So hmm. I don't know if you well, have a good, yeah, don't. No, it's all good. I mean, I, I like questions that I haven't really thought of exactly before because it, it makes me kind of, you know, bring in a lot of the work that I've done over so many years. I mean, I think it's, th there is just a huge number of things that are, that are contributing to this. And I mean, we see type one diabetes in adults now, and we never used to see type one diabetes. So this is like type one diabetes is when you have no insulin production at all. And like this used to only happen in children and it was very rare. Now it happens much more commonly in children and it happens in adults, which is like, which is when basically you have autoimmune destruction of the cells that make insulin in your pancreas. So like, why is that happening? It's gotta be toxins in our environment, right? It's gotta be toxic exposure. Um, it can be anything from the food we're eating to the water we're drinking to other things that we're putting in our body or whatever. Okay. So it's, I think there's a lot of things, the autoimmune piece is huge and that's happening, not just with diabetes, but it's happening across the board with autoimmunity rising everywhere. And I think this is, this is toxicity environmental almost mm -hmm. 100%. Okay. You know, when it comes to diabetes itself, I mean, I think that a lot of that has to do with toxins, environmental. I mean, we know how profound the obesity crisis is, how profound metabolic syndrome is, or just metabolic, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, how poorly metabolic most of the country is. I think it's like 95% of adults have poor metabolic function or something like that. It's like some ridiculous number like that. When you look at some of these other metrics that are more like under the hood than just going to your regular doctor, for example. So I think a lot of this has to do with symptoms of a larger problem, right? Um, certainly sugar is a big issue, certainly refined carbohydrates, you know, seed oils is relatively new on the scene as far as, is it, a, is it a cause of diabetes specifically? I don't know other than to say that they cause inflammation and inflammation can cause autoimmunity over time. And then autoimmunity can destroy pancreas. So like, I think that's possibly, possibly part of it. I mean, I don't know about the seed oil specifically. I don't know that data, mm. but uh, I, I tend to think about this as sort of you know, high level, what do we want to do about this? We still want to do the exact same things here. We want to look at the mm -hmm. foundational markers. We want to start there. We want to look at vitamins, minerals, nutrients, gut health. At the same time as we're changing diet, changing lifestyle, working on supplementation and exercise, of course. And like, so, but you have to get people to sign on to these kinds of things, yeah. right? So it's not like your average diabetic that's on insulin is going to be like, okay, I'm ready to do everything right. with my diet. They're right? going to do all 10 things that we yeah. do now. Exactly. But I mean, there are some like, so they've done some really interesting work in the ketogenic community, actually. I'm sure you've heard of this with Diab diabetes as a company. I think it's called Verta Health Verta, or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. And they do ketogenic coaching and they've had a lot of success with both type two and type one diabetes. So I, I think that there's a lot to do here. I think it just depends on you know, where people are ready to engage, you know? Um, and so, I mean, some of these new diabetic meds are interesting right now. They're being used as anti-aging meds now too. So, um, you have things like Ozempic and, and others that are, that are, that are decreasing body fat very quickly in people and, you know, decreasing their, uh, as a result of that, they're also helping get in, getting their diabetes under better control. Um, uh, but interestingly, they also take away lean body mass at the same time. So you have to be careful there. At least that one does, Ozempic does, there's some new ones that may not, but Anyway, long story short is that um, there's a lot of contributors uh, to, to, to type 2 diabetes and type 1. There is. Yeah. And I, I'm always worried about these new medications. Like what are the other side effects? Like what are the downstream effects going to be? Like you said, yeah. like lean body mass disappearing. Um, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a zero sum guy. As I said, I do think that there's a role for some of these things, especially in some of the, like people that are extremely overweight and have a lot of fat to lose. I think it could be a great motivator to get on some of these drugs potentially, and then help you know get them down and then get them mm. exercising and do those kinds of things. So I think the key is, there, and this is always hard for people, the key is in the nuance of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, I can give almost everybody methylene blue, which is good, but I can't, you know, I can't always give everybody just supplements or just, and definitely I don't want to just do drugs if I can, but oftentimes it's, there's a combination of things that can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I think of type two diabetes and this insulin resistance that could be the 
foundation of a lot of our chronic disease. As, For sure. Like in, in a simple sense, it's like energy toxicity. It's like your body has too much energy and doesn't know what to do with it. Energy as in fats or carbs or, you know what I mean? Not like the other kind yes. of energy. Right? Sure, sure. And then it, so it doesn't know what to do with it. I, like there's this idea of the personal fat threshold and um, yeah, it's just basically why are these fat cells becoming overstuffed? And I guess there's a lot of reasons why it could be, but like you said, all the interventions that you talk about do revert, you know, go help this situation. So mm -hmm. it's like, maybe mm -hmm. if we don't know, it's something about getting people to not have too much energy, which meaning like not eating refined foods or doing some exercise or, you know what I mean? It's like getting them, if, if they are properly satiated with good animal protein, then they won't eat too much energy and then end up with these energy problems. Yeah. I mean, certainly the more refined the food, the less we have these signals in our brain to tell us to stop eating them. That is for yeah. sure. Um, and so that's certainly the Dorito in a nutshell, right? This beautifully mm -hmm. crafted chip with these 35 different ingredients for crunch, for, for flavor, for mouth feel, like yeah. all those kinds of, it's amazing what goes into that stuff. And, but a steak tastes pretty good too, if it's done right. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Actually, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I don't think it's all just flavor because I eat delicious foods. Every meal of mine is absolutely delicious yeah. and amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, yeah, this delicious steak cooked perfectly, like amazing eggs, you know, from the local farm, blah, blah, blah. I'm not overeating though. Because yeah. I'm not eating for a long time after I, I am properly satiated for the correct amount of time. And then I eat again. Yeah. The satiety piece is what they are obviously driving in processed foods, right? They want you to keep eating them. Yeah. So you don't get, you don't get the same satiety signals as you would from a, a piece of meat or some eggs or something with more protein and more fat in it for sure. Big stuff, yeah. big stuff. Okay. Yeah. Methylene blue. We're fine. We're, we're tackling it head on. Tell nice. us what it is and what it does. Yeah. So, I mean, we've, we've given context for how I think about this, right? So methylene blue has been around for a long time. It's been, uh, it's a synthetic ingredient. It was first registered with the FDA as the first drug with the FDA back in the 1890s. And it was mm -hmm. used initially as an antimicrobial. It was used as to treatment as a treatment for malaria and as an anti-parasitic, as an antifungal and as an antibacterial. And it was used in this way until antibiotics came around in the 1950s. And then methylene blue kind of came out of favor major reason why people didn't like methylene blue is that because of the coloring itself, it actually, it concentrates in your urine. So when you take it orally or take it IV, it doesn't matter, um, or in a trochee and in the buccal cavity, as I was describing earlier, it's going to, it's going to concentrate in your urine. So you're going to pee out blue urine. So your urine will be blue when you take methylene blue. And that's not a, a bad thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's something that we can actually somewhat use as a marker of how much methylene blue is being used in the body, we think. The idea is this. So methylene blue works in your mitochondria. Your mitochondria are the part of your cell that make energy. And making energy is one of the most important things that our cells do. Make We make trillions of ATP molecules every second. It's kind of ridiculous. And ATP is the currency of our cells. So what methylene blue helps do is helps increase the amount of ATP that you make. And it does that by donating what are called electrons to your electron transport chain in your mitochondria. This is the part of your uh, mitochondria that help shuttle the, so basically we eat so that we can make electrons so that we can make energy is what it comes down to, ladies and gentlemen. And so, I mean, there's other things that are going on, obviously, mm -hmm. but in general, that, that's what we need on a, on a regular clip there every second, as I described. And so methylene blue helps increase the amount of energy you're making. And then at the same time, it also helps with your resilience piece too, because it helps increase your antioxidant capacity. It's called an electron cycler, if anybody likes the nerdy stuff, in the sense that you help donate electrons to the electron transport chain, and then you accept them back. So what, what happens is when you make ATP, when you make energy, you also make what are quote unquote called waste products of energy metabolism. One of those is water, another one is carbon dioxide, although that's not really a waste product at all, but we can, that's another story. And then there's also what are called reactive oxygen species. These are what are called ROS or oxidative stress. People have heard all these kind of words or uh, probably before. And what happens is we need, we need some of those oxidative molecules to help the system work better. It helps actually the mitochondria understand how much energy to make, how much not to make. Feedback loops are really important. But if that stuff builds up, then that's when you start getting inflammation and rust and your mitochondria stop working very well is what it comes down to. And actually one of the major reasons we age is that our mitochondria start stop working as well because of this process of, of energy metabolism. The thing about, uh, we, we make a lot of energy. We're very efficient at it, um, compared to like anaerobic respiration or making, uh, or making energy through that 
pathway, which is through lactate and things like that. It's a very, it does make energy, but it doesn't make a lot of energy. Um, we're very good at it, but the problem is that we have all these, you know, quote unquote waste products that do build up over time, cause mitochondrial dysfunction and can cause aging really, you know, mitochondrial theory of aging. I mean, certainly a big piece of it. So methane blue has the ability to give you some antioxidant reserve at the same time as it's giving you energy. And as a result of that, um, you are seeing uh, benefits on both sides, right? You're seeing benefits on people that need more energy. Like if you have brain fog, that means your, your brain is not getting enough energy. Your brain is extremely hungry for oxygen. It takes 20% of all of your oxygen flow at any one time. And so even if you're not getting, uh, even, even if you're getting all that oxygen, but you're not getting enough energy produ produced because of maybe your mitochondria aren't working that well, then, you, then brain fog, de decreased concentration, fatigue, all those things are very common as a result of not getting enough mm. energy produced in that area. So methylene blue concentrate, concentrates in areas where you have the most mitochondria as well. So you have your most mitochondria in your brain, your heart, your liver, and your muscle tissue. So it's a supportive, and that, that's why I think of methylene blue as a... Like it's something that you could take on a regular basis to support your mitochondrial function, especially if you're going through a challenging time. But even if you're not, most people are subject to bad light, to bad food, to bad, excuse me, bad air stressors. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Bad doctors, whatever, yeah. you know, whatever all the time. And so it's important to have something that can support your system. Uh, I think at a regular clip for most people. And then of course, uh, a lot of it depends on your dosing. So there's lower dose methylene blue and there's higher dosing methylene blue, like lower dose is really good for optimizing the system. As I was just describing, uh, higher doses can be good as an anti-infective as a, in combination with certain spectrums of light as an antibacterial antiviral, for example, um, at the lower doses, we're looking at like somewhere between six or four, about four or five milligrams to about. 30 milligrams is like a lower dose of methylene blue. Mm -hmm. And like that's lower dose for health optimization purposes. Um, and then you have higher dosing, as I described, that you can really do um, for like more antiviral, antibacterial uh, types of processes as well. Yeah, I have some of your stuff here, the transcription stuff. So yeah, just blue. Yeah, and I had the canatine one too. That's the one I took earlier. I like yeah. that one. It. Well, there's other stuff in it too, but it just, it feels like my brain's alive. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It feels like I don't need caffeine too. I mean, I guess it has a small amount of caffeine in it, but it's like, I don't yeah. have to drink coffee anymore. And I don't know, just so many things. This stuff is, is pretty awesome. I, I've just started getting into it, but I think, I don't know what, do people try it? Like what, what's the deal? I know you don't want to just um, say like, just take it. I mean, I guess you can actually, but you, you try to use it more strategically or do you let people yeah, just take yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Everything in context, Brian. I mean, that's the idea, right? So the just blue that you have there is pure methylene blue. And that's really a great supportive. It's going to help with mitochondrial optimization. It's mm -hmm. going to give you a subtle rise in elevation in mood, in, in energy, but it's not going to be like launching you into productivity focus for the most part, because it doesn't have any stimulants in it. Mm -hmm. So it, at our company at Transcriptions, we kind of, we've broken down nootropics into three categories. Nootropics for those who don't know are brain enhancing supplements or drugs. Okay. But really there's three major categories of them. The first one is what I would call a health optimization nootropic, something that supports the system, helps you make more energy, but it does it in more of a, let's call it a holistic way, right? It's actually helping the system work better without clocking it to do anything that it doesn't typically do. Okay. Um, then you have performance optimization nootropics. These are ones that help you perform a task better, but are not necessarily healthy for your brain. This is something like caffeine or nicotine or Adderall or some of the racetams out there for those who take them. They clock the system. They help you perform a task better, but they're not necessarily healthy for the system because they are stimulating the system to work harder. Okay. And then, then there's the third category, which we call blue tropics, the, the, the word or the color blue with the the, the tropics at the end, blue tropics, because the category is really exemplified by methylene blue because methylene blue has the ability of increasing the health of the system by energy and resilience, but also it's building more energy in the system. And it's also helping with neurotransmitter release as well. It's got a little bit of neurotransmitter release related to its, its method mechanisms of action. So you're getting more norepinephrine, more dopamine, more serotonin being released at the same time with methylene blue. So it's doing both. It's helping you 
stimulate the system to work a little bit harder because it's, it's releasing some of this other stuff as I just described, but it's also building more resilience in the system and giving you antioxidant reserve. So that's why we call it a blue tropic. Mm -hmm. And then that's just blue for you is pure methylene blue. And then we have blue canatine, which is our, we call our blue tropic stack with methylene blue, nicotine, caffeine, and CBD. So caffeine and nicotine are both stimulants. They both are performance optimization nootropics. And it's great. Caffeine works great for a lot of people. I, I mean, nicotine also is fantastic if you're not smoking it or vaping it mm -hmm. because yeah. it's a great nootropic. It helps with concentration, focus, attention, and it's been studied in Alzheimer's and it's studied in myocognitive impairment and it works really well. You just don't want to smoke it or vape it because it could be addicting that way because nicotine can be addicting if you get a hit that quickly. In a trochee, like what we use in a very low dose of nicotine, we're just using one milligram in a full trochee. In a cigarette or a vaping product, it's at least six to eight milligrams per hit per per inhale basically um and you know a lot more in that than that in a cigarette for example mm -hmm. if you're using a very low dose and you're using it as, as a slow acting formula it could be fantastically effective for helping you with with cognition as i was describing before um, but also we have cbd in there and cbd is actually falls into the health optimization nootropic category because it's supporting the system it's helping with anandamide release which is this neurotransmitter that helps with bliss and it's neuroprotective and it's anti-inflammatory so it's got that piece in there too so uh, the blue canatine is the one that if people want for like focus productivity you know getting shit done it's sort of like our limitless mm -hmm. kind of pill for your 4 to 6 hours kind of deal but there's no jitteriness when you start and there's no crash at the end because we have the CBD and the methylene blue in there to help you ride that wave with a nice up and down kind of feel. Um, and the trochees also, um, they're squares and they, they, can be, and they can be cut into fourths. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to take a full square. You can take a quarter, you can take a half, you can take a three quarters, you can take a full, mm -hmm. depending on what your dosing is. You know, For me, for example, I'll be interested in what your dosing is, Brian, but for me is like I take a quarter of a blue canatine and I'm good mm -hmm. because I don't drink any caffeine typically anymore. So but somebody that drinks a lot of caffeine, they may need more. What is your, what is your dose? I you only is? do a quarter. Quarter yeah, is, a quarter. I am good for hours. It's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So some people are a quarter is that's all you need. And then some people it's a half and some people it's a full. And, and so it depends on your sensitivity and it depends on a couple of different things. One of them is how optimal, how optimized you are. Typically you need less, the more optimized you are, mm -hmm. except if you have a lot of lean body mass, if you are swole if you're uh -huh. jacked yeah. like like those those guys and those women have a higher metabolic rate and so sometimes they need a higher dose mm. to get the same effect their livers are just really good at detoxifying so like mm -hmm. they're, they're they're just working harder on a, on a general clip but in general so that's the great thing about those two products is that they're titratable you don't start with a full trochee you can start with a quarter and then you can do a half or a full and the the just blue the pure methylene blue trochee the one without nicotine and caffeine in it, this one can be swallowed as well if you don't want to have a blue mouth. So, because methylene blue is, I was talking about bioavailability in the beginning of the podcast, I think. And so, be, certain products will not do well as as well if you digest them and go through digestion. They uh, they go through your liver and they get inactivated. But methylene blue doesn't actually have that problem. It actually stays active. But the nice thing about dissolving in your mouth is it's going to work faster and it's going to be more focused on your brain. But if you have more fatigue, if you have more like exercise intolerance, for example, and I speak to a lot of people, just spoke to a lady yesterday with exercise intolerance related to uh, a previous viral infection that was still causing issues. And she was using methylene blue as, a, as a, a way to help with exercise intolerance. And it was helping her because it's going to go to your mitochondria and your muscles at that point. So like those are some of the ways you can think about using it. You don't have to potentially swallow, put it in your mouth and let it dissolve. Mm -hmm. As you can see from your mouth, your mouth does turn blue. There you go. A little bit the on half the right smurf, side there, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the half smurf as we like to say. Mm. Um, but, and that's important, especially for blue canatine because that one's got the nicotine and caffeine in it. So it's gonna work faster mm -hmm. that way. It still works if you swallow it, but not as fast. Um, but the methylene blue, if it's pure methylene blue, the just blue, it's really great to swallow it as well and still get some of those mm. benefits. Um, the key with methylene blue though, just to finish up uh, one more point is that you wanna make sure you're getting good sources of this. Um, methylene blue is known as fish tank cleaner as well mm. in some worlds. It's still, it actually still use, is used in, in fish tank cleaner, but there's a lot of impurities in that. And I don't recommend drinking fish tank cleaner anytime soon. Please, Definitely not. And gentlemen. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I get the good stuff, obviously. Yeah, this stuff, I don't know, is it, is it highly regulated? Like. 
So it's regulated on both sides. You can get it as a drug. You can get it from a, a pharmacy. Um, a compounding pharmacies will, will, will make it. And you can also get it uh, as an over-the-counter as something you can buy on our website at you know, on transcriptions or you can buy on Amazon. So that's why I want to be clear with people. You got to be careful of the quality mm -hmm. that you're getting. And oftentimes it's usually dose is a dropper, like a methylene blue dropper. Mm -hmm. And that's really difficult to dose. And it's usually much higher dose. So just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do the higher dose for too long most of the time. Well, yeah. Thanks for offering our audience a, a discount with Sapien. Yeah. So yeah, people can use the code Sapien for 10% off and try transcriptions. I'm a believer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about it if I'm not a believer. And uh, man, it is awesome. So yeah, yeah check well, it out. Is it transcriptions.com? Yeah. The key always with, with these products when you're listening is to say, what am I, what are my goals here? Right. For methylene blue, it's a really great supportive. If you have mitochondrial dysfunction, it's a great way to support your mitochondria. If you're an endurance athlete, if you're somebody that's working really hard and has a hard time with recovery, this also can be very helpful for you too. So it's kind of across the gamut you know, mm -hmm. with blue canatine, with the stimulants in there, with nicotine and caffeine, just be aware that it has stimulants in there, right? It ha and so you don't really want to do stimulants every day. If you can avoid them, you should probably cycle them on and off. It's really mm -hmm. good for your system to do that. And, and this is why it's always in the context for us of truly being on the path to optimizing your health over the long term by doing the the foundational work at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we have one other product too that's not based on methylene blue called Trocom. And this is a this is not methylene blue based. It's got kava, CBD, CBG, which are both non-psychoactive cannabinoids, and it has GABA in there too, called B3 GABA. It's great for relaxation, stress reduction, uh, taking the edge off. Um, again, titratable. So you can start off with a quarter or go to a full. Like I like a quarter if you're stressed during the day because it kind of takes that edge off a little bit. You know, when you're really stressed, you can't remember your lines. You can't remember your words. Your mind goes blank. That's mm -hmm. your sympathetic dominance. Like, oh shit, I need to run mm -hmm. or I need to play dead, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing that your brain's doing. So when that happens, your mind goes blank. So taking the edge off a little bit can be really, really helpful. And for people that wind down or have a hard time winding down at night and they don't want to drink alcohol, uh, which is obviously terrible for you. I think most of us know that at this mm -hmm. point, especially for terrible for your sleep. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, this is a great alternative potentially for, for you to, to think about, uh, if your mind races before you go to bed, you have a hard time falling asleep. This is another great way to help wind down as you're doing your, hopefully your other sleep hygiene as well. And not mm -hmm. just trying to hit the pillow kind of deal. But, and again, that's, that's always the key, right? There's no, you can't out supplement somebody's shitty lifestyle for the yeah. most part. Or, and I always say that about almost everything that I do. Right. So like you can't out supplement, you can't out exercise, you can't fill in the blank. Right. So. Yeah, I, I agree. And I did try the calm last night and no, I felt great. I'm very sensitive to this stuff and I, I felt yeah, very good. And I did sleep very well, but yeah, I love that. Don't, don't just rely on it. Like, Oh, I'm now I can do whatever I want and I'm just going to pop this little thing and I'm fine. Absolutely yeah, not. Yeah. We're not your average supplement company in that capacity, like yeah. we're a formula company, really, because we, we create formulas that I, I created formulas with with my with my team. Dr. Ted is the master formulator, really, that we could use in clinical practice, that we could use for our patients that were going through challenging times um, or that were really, you know, on the athletic side and they wanted to be performing at a higher clip, at a higher level. Like, but these are things that we use clinically, we, that we've tested clinically, and that everything's pharmaceutical grade or precision is everything's precision dosed. Everything comes with its own certifications of analysis. Like we, we're not, you know, fly by nights here. We've been doing this for a couple of years and, you know, we're really excited for some new products to come out hopefully in the next you know year or so uh, that really kind of move the needle on some of these other major things that we have, you know, ongoing as a society. But in general, it, it doesn't take the place of anything else that we've described for most of this podcast, which is, you know, do the work, look at your foundation, work with a practitioner that can help you. Um, a lot of the, the work you can do on your own, like you said, Brian, I think having a simple framework and starting to work with that and your diet, your lifestyle, your exercise, even the basic stuff can go like you can go so far with that, but then ready to dial it in, really work on that foundation. Look at those metrics. I think metabolomics is the, is the wave of the future, really. Um, it's it's going to be there with your your genome and your proteome and your transcriptome and and your metabolome are all going to be going together and something called your narcissome. It's like all about you, man, like mm. everything about from like from your DNA to how you're actually seeing things in your cells. And then even more, maybe, maybe even going deeper, like onto like the subtle energy side of things eventually and looking at the energetics of of how things are working and, and moving together is are things that are happening now in science, which is super cool. So not ready for prime time, but everything else is getting there, which is super cool. Excited for the future. Yeah. I, I, so I have three things I got to wrap up. But yeah. before we get to hyperbaric too, that's the fourth thing. Yeah. Yeah. One, 
I realized I shouldn't have called it energy before you started talking about ATP and mitochondrial energy because energy, I was using energy in the sense of just fat and carbs coming into your diet, yes. right? So just, I just want to let people know fat and carbs just fuel your body for you, right? And these are fuel sources and people can have too much of them and get type two diabetes, right? Over time, but completely different is just your body producing ATP and, and, you know, so just want to make that clear uh, to nicotine. Uh, it's sort of controversial. People have this idea that it's bad because yes, like you said, smoking, vaping, it is bad, but in low doses for many years now, off and on, I've been experimenting with it as a nootropic. Mm. Great. I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. And I've never done it more than like one mil, like two milligrams and only like three times per week, four times a week. I've never even, you know, gone beyond maybe like eight grams in a week ever, but I just want to, you. yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I think I appreciate you making the point. Yeah. And, okay. And then, huh. So that was two, three. Oh, three is you have, so you have a nonprofit and then for profit. So just explain that really. So what is your nonprofit? You, you briefly yeah. mentioned in the beginning. Yeah, sure. The nonprofit is, is called Health Optimization Medicine and Practice. This is a nonprofit organization that's training doctors and practitioners. So you don't have to be licensed to get trained on how to optimize health rather than treat disease. And it's a seven module certification course with two advanced practice modules as well. These are things that you didn't learn in medical school if you're a doctor like me. And it's these are not things you would learn in any practitioner school, really. Look, looking at metabolomics, uh, some of the other aspects are looking at chronobiology, which is the study of circadian rhythms, uh, epigenetics, gut health, uh, bioenergetics, specifically the mitochondria, exposomics, evolutionary medicine. So these are things that you can check out at homehope.org if you have any interest in getting trained or learning or, or maybe finding a practitioner. Uh, we're just starting, uh, we, so we don't have a huge amount of practitioner list so far, but we're hoping to grow that. Over, especially over over this year, over 2023. So very excited for that. Um, and then that's the nonprofit organization. And then the for-profit organization is the one that grew out of the nonprofit called, mm -hmm. the, the umbrella name is Smarter Not Harder. And the company under that is called Transcriptions. And that company makes precision dose pharmaceutical grade and physician formulated buccal trochies. These are the trochies that dissolve in your mouth that we described. Uh, we have the ones uh, blue canatine, just blue, uh, both on both based on methylene blue. The blue canatine has the nicotine and caffeine in it, and then we have our other one called Trocom for relaxation and mm. stress reduction. Yeah, good stuff. And then, well, just your own practice to working with yeah. people. Uh, you can work yeah. with Doctor Scott. Well, I don't want to wrap it up like quite yet. It sounds like wrapping up. Okay. But yeah, people can no, find you and work with you online. Okay. Or in yeah, person. excellent. Yeah, yeah. So I have uh, my own clinical practice. It's based using the health optimization medicine framework as my foundation, and then it has on top of that really my my specialty, if you want to call it that, is is hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which I've been involved with over the last. Uh, over 10 years now. And I work with people all over the country. I work with people that have clinics that are setting up, looking to integrate hyperbaric therapy, like within a larger context of other modalities, whatever they might be, whether they might be medical or optimization, biohacking, whatever you want to call it. And that I work with individuals that help set them up with hyperbaric protocols within their own local areas with facilities or get them chambers for their house, if, if that makes sense in, in their case, for example. And yes, again, like I said, most of my time with people, 80% of it, regardless of what they come find me for, is has nothing to do with hyperbaric therapy and everything about everything we've discussed here mm -hmm. for, for the most part. And so it's apt that we finish about on hyperbarics if you'd like to, because that's, that's this is what I typically would do anyway. Fourth thing so. on the list, fourth thing on the list, hyperbaric. Tell us more. Yeah, I mean, the short story of it is that it's a fantastic technology for healing and for optimization because you're getting more oxygen in the system, you're making more energy, and as a result of that, you are creating a stimulus for the body to, to change in various ways that make it more optimal um, and help it recover better. So the thing about hyperbaric therapy is, is, is that it's very simple. It's just increased oxygen under in increased atmospheric pressure. So you breathe more oxygen and you pressurize the system to more than sea level. And as a result of that, you drive more oxygen in circulation. Typically we carry it on red blood cells, but in a hyperbaric chamber, we can actually drive it into the plasma or the liquid of your bloodstream. And acutely you have a decrease in low oxygen levels. So if you've had an acute trauma, for example, there's low oxygen, then all of a sudden you have more oxygen in the system. You could potentially reverse or prevent some of the downstream damage, heart attacks, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, trauma to a limb, et cetera. You can prevent a lot of the downstream damage if you can get oxygen into the system faster. Okay. Of course, don't go to your 
local hyperbaric facility before going to the hospital if you're having a stroke or a heart attack mm-hmm. or a brain injury, please, ladies and gentlemen. It should be obvious, but you never know. And and then so they, acutely you have all this oxygen going in, reversing low oxygen state. You're also decreasing inflammation. You're causing stem cells to be starting to release. It's antibacterial, antiviral, anti fungal as well, and it helps with blood flow. And then over the long term, over like a hyperbaric protocol, which is typically over maybe 10 or 20 or maybe more sessions, depending on what you need to do, um, you have a cumulative exposure of the hyperbaric experience and then and the oxygen, and you're actually changing epigenetics. You're actually shifting how your genes express various things. About 8,000 genes are oxygen and pressure sensitive at least. And you're basically pr- increasing the system's ability to keep inflammation down over the long term, create new blood vessels in areas that have been damaged, and then you're, now you're regenerating blood vessels in areas that have been damaged. Um, your those stem cells are now maturing into areas or becoming the, the the types of cells that are required to make those areas heal and maintain themselves over the long t- over the long term, as well as d- downregulating inflammatory factors like uh, cytokines and things like that too. So that's the the very short story of what hyperbaric therapy can do. It's pretty cool. The problem is it's expensive. So, I mean, you have to yeah. like find a clinic where uh, they, you know, they do it. And I mean, I guess they have home versions, but they, they may or may not be that great. And we have a mutual friend, Dom D'Agostino, that people probably heard of that's doing yeah. interesting research. Do you know yeah. what he's doing? Maybe give him yeah, a Yeah, Dom recap. does a lot of work on, uh, so he was one of the first guys that came out on research using uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy with the ketogenic diet in a metastatic model of cancer. And so his work has been really great. Unfortunately, it hasn't been done in humans yet, but um, but there's a lot of interest in using the chambers along with the ketogenic diet specifically for cancer and something called the press pulse technique, which is something that he and Dr. Tom Seafried, uh, a researcher in Boston have spoken about for many years. That That's Dom, Dom's major area. He's also in the performance area, but he does a lot of work with uh, with cancer specifically. And then he also does a lot of work with Navy and Navy SEALs and things like mm-hmm. that, putting them under hyperbaric conditions and then seeing how long it takes them to have seizures. And so like, and that's the, being on, being on a ketogenic diet or taking ketone supplementation, especially esters, p- potentially pr- decreases your risk of seizures. And so if you're a Navy SEAL uh, and you're breathing 100% oxygen underwater, you don't want to have a seizure in general. So it's not a good idea. So like he's, he's, he's so he works with the Office of Navy Navy Research Naval Research there. Um, but um, on the home chamber side, just to make a point of that, like there are some utility. There is some utility of having uh, home chambers, I think, and I think it's more for neurocognitive optimization and generalized well-being, I would say, because I think it's it's a great anti-inflammatory. It's just a nice way of getting a little more oxygen in the system and helping optimize it. It helps with recovery. It can help with muscle recovery, You know, m- minor injuries, even major injuries. It's going to help you recover faster. Although a, a medical grade, like a deeper chamber might be better in those cases, depending on, on needs and things like that. So, um, but yeah, so I think that there's, I mean, I have a home chamber in my house that I use regularly. I have protocols that I've developed uh, for neurologic optimization, for muscle recovery, for jet lag, for for performance, for boosting, for cognitive mm. uh, cognitive boost to spell. Like you just go into the chamber and then you go into a cold tub or for me, I go outside, go outside in Colorado and I feel, I feel pretty good. So, you know, there's, there's various ways that you can use these things medically. Like we use it for diabetic foot ulcers. We use it for cancer radiation injury. We use it for, uh, for diabetic foot, uh, foot ulcers, which I already said, I think, right. So, mm-hmm. um, I said, uh, what else am I missing? There's like, there's four major things on the, uh, the insurance wise that we use it for. Mm-hmm. Uh, radiation injury from cancer, diabetes, uh, bone infections, and um, uh, what is this? What else am I missing? It's obvious, but um, it'll come back to me. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll give it to you for your guys in the show notes. But um, anyway, and then we all use it for a lot of other, what we call like investigational, so not approved for insurance in the US, but we still have a lot of great uh, data like traumatic brain injury and stroke and uh, chronic pain syndromes and um, Looks like it also increases your VO2 max, by the way. So it can increase your VO2 max. Um, it also seems to reverse age by um, helping with telomere length, lengthening, and also increases blood vascularization in the brain. So you can see the brain come back online um, after, you know, even with aging, but even also with with injury as well. So a lot of cool stuff. A lot of cool stuff that, that hyperbaric therapy can do. It is. It sounds amazing. It, and is it kind of just like mimicking you going into like really high altitude or really low altitude? So the, it would be the, the low altitude. Low alt- yeah. Um, so yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Because what we're doing is we're pressurizing you like under a certain amount of seawater. So like it, it's basically we're in a chamber, you're increasing the amount of pressure on the system and it's going to increase, um, 
the amount of oxygen they can get in the system because there's more pressure. So it's increasing pressure. So it's like being under like in a, in a regular medical unit that's going to two atmospheres, which is a pretty common pressure. That's 33 feet of seawater equivalent, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine there's 33 feet of seawater above you, um, you have all that pressure of that water on your body, driving things into circulation. So. Yeah. I don't know why I asked that because I knew that, but I was thinking of high altitude training where you can, yeah, you know, go opposite. up and, and train and that, that has a different effect for, you know, training athletes and stuff like that. And that's hypoxic. That's a hypoxic environment, yeah. right? That's a low oxygen environment. And that stimulates epigen release, which is a hormone from your kidneys to help you produce more red blood cells. Because that's typically how people will train is that they increase the number of red blood cells in circulation to increase oxygen carrying capacity. That's great. That does work. I mean, people come to Colorado all the time to do that, but hyperbaric therapy is doing it a little bit differently. It's actually saturating the oxygen in the plasma or the liquid of the bloodstream, as opposed to being in the, um, into on the red blood cells themselves. And the red blood cells do a pretty good job of it. An amazing job of it, actually a fantastic job of it at, at baseline. And, and so we're, if you put a pulse ox on your finger, that's measuring the sites of your red blood cells that are carrying oxygen. That's like 98%, right? There's 1 billion oxygen molecules per red blood cell. So like, it's a huge amount of oxygen that we're carrying already, but if you want to get more in, you need the number of red blood cells to go up, or you need the number, the amount being saturated in the liquid of the bloodstream to go up your choice. All right. I think we've given people enough information for one day. Yeah. I was about to say that's probably its own. Oh man. Yeah. It's we, its just, thing. yeah. we just blasted them. Like I love nutrient dense foods and we just gave them a, a nutrient information dense podcast here. Yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. We did. <laughs> we gave them a lot. Well, thanks so much. Uh, so yeah, do you do any like social media stuff, Dr. Scott? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Scott Scherr, D-R-S-E-O-T-T-S-H-E-R-R. -T -T -E um, also, Troscriptions is on Instagram, at Troscriptions. It's the word, it's the letters T-R-O and then the word prescription, but just the end of the word. Mm -hmm. So Troscriptions in there. As prescription great as we can without being a prescription kind of deal. So And then Troscriptions.com. If you're interested in the nonprofit, you can go to homehope.org. And if you want to consult with me personally, you can go to my website. You can either go to Instagram, you can send me a message there, or drscottscher.com is an easy way to find me too. Good stuff. Well, yeah, use that code SAPIEN to get 10% off. Thanks for that. And uh, thanks so much for this episode. I hope to see you soon in Austin. Yes, soon, soon. I hope to. Take awesome. care, man. Thank you.